afternoon. Welcome to this week's Academic Wednesday Worldwide Webinar from the Institute of Economic Affairs in cooperation with the Vincent Centre, University of Buckingham, with me, Syed Kamal. I'm the Academic and Research Director here at the IEA. I'm also a Professor of Politics and International Relations at St Mary's University, Twickenham. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, the IEA is an educational charity. Uh, we were founded in 1955 to improve the understanding of the fundamental institutions of a free society. And we do this by analyzing and explaining the role of markets in solving economic and social problems. The, the subject of today's webinar is the economy after COVID-19 uh, with Professor Trevor Williams. I appreciate the fact that we are clashing with um, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak's uh, speech where he's gonna outline some ideas for reboosting the economy. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today. Now, before I introduce our speaker, can I just talk you through the format? Uh, we are recording this webinar and the Q&A, and it will be rebroadcast later on our IEA channel, uh, our YouTube channel, IEA London. And what we'll do, we'll start with a talk from Trevor. Please feel free to submit questions during this presentation. Don't feel that you have to wait during the, uh, the question and answer session, but you can do so if you prefer. Now, when you ask a question, there are two options at the bottom of your screen. If you move your cursor or mouse down, you'll see the chat function and the Q&A function please use a Q&A function to ask questions. Only use the chat function if you want to share some relevant links. And I know that we, we will, and maybe I'll invite Trevor to uh, share any relevant links in the chat function. Or also if you have a technical problem and you want to check whether it's your end or, or at our end. Um, as, as I may have said before, um, you do have the option in Q&A to ask your question anonymously, and please select that. I tend to alternate between um, questions uh, from a named person and anonymous, just, uh, just so you're aware. Now, after Trevor's finished speaking, I will then move to the Q&A. And if we, have too, if, if we have too many questions or more questions than time allows, let's put it that way, um, what I tend to do is ask you to go into the Q&A function and vote on those questions that you think deserve to be asked. So we do this in a very democratic way, almost like a sort of football league way, and the most popular questions go up to the top of, of the table and I'll ask them. Now, what I won't do, I won't ask you to ask your question in person. I will ask your question on your behalf to save time and technical problems. Um, so please uh, be as full as you can in your question, uh, but try and keep it as brief as possible as well. So now to our speaker, delighted to welcome Trevor Williams. He's a former chief economist at Lloyds Bank. He's a visiting professor at the University of Derby and at St Mary's University in Twickenham. He's the rotating chair of the Institute of Economic Affairs Shadow Monetary Policy Committee and co-author of Trade Economics. Trevor lectures at St. Mary's and at Cardiff Business School. He writes a monthly economic column for Money Facts. He speaks at corporate conferences and events and appears in the financial press and on television regularly to discuss and comment on economic issues. Trevor, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm gonna to hand the floor over to you. Uh, pleasure to be here, Sai. Thank you very much for that uh, fulsome um, introduction. I couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> Um, thank you very much everyone for being on the call. What I'm going to do now is to run through my views of, it's not so much the post-COVID economy, it's how we live with COVID. That point must be made. I don't think it's going to go away. It's going to join a lexion uh, of pathogens which uh, stay in the human population, but I think we will be able to cope with it um, as ever. But what I will do is to look at what some of the uh, shorter term effects of it are over the next uh, period ahead. And I'll make some longer term points about what pandemics have generally done. So let me share my slides and to kick off by stating what the, the main agenda points are. And hopefully you can all spell agenda, uh, which I've made a mistake on at the top. So where we are is a, a one in 100 year event. What's notable is that this is the second event that we've had in a decade which could be termed a one in 100 year event. In other words, we seem to be having more regular events which in theory have low probabilities attached to them but have high event risk. So we seem to be in a world which has so many more people in it, uh, which is so interconnected, having shocks transmitted much more quickly. Now, the thing about plagues, just to uh, summarize some of the key points, is that they have a huge effects on social and political. And, uh, for example, they have helped to end empires, freed serfs and others, the peasants revolt, 
um, notably uh, or cited as one. They have, in the aftermath, boosted wages and productivity for those that are left after these pandemics. Capital does get depleted usually in these events as well, partly because, of course, people are capital. And so when uh, they die, uh, there's a depletion of capital taking place. Big social and political changes can occur, therefore. And I can just cite a few 19, after the 1918 pandemic and post the First World War, the birth of the Labour Party, workers' rights, women got the vote, and so on. After World War II, a continuation of World War I and the pandemic, we saw, of course, a birth of a whole host of global institutions in the UK, NHS, free education, lots of nationalizations took place. So one of the questions we should ask ourselves in this one, will we see a repeat of economic nationalism, misguided economic policies, and the sort of risks which led to uh, some of the events which occurred in the decades after. I will focus somewhat on the UK and, um, and a few points on uh, who are some of the winners and losers from this. So sectors, for example, tech, internet, health related seem to be winners. Travel, hospitality seems to be the losers. Uh, women and the young seems to be the losers in the economic sphere. Um, some of the winners are clearly those with more capital or more access to wealth and the older uh, ones uh, in an economic sense because capital is being driven up by the economic policies uh, that have been pursued to alleviate the crisis. Um, so I think there's lots for us to, to talk about and lots of issues which we could discuss. But let me just look at the history of pandemics. And this is a study which was done not so um, long ago, which focused on, on Europe partly because uh, the data for some of the economic effects were more recorded than they would have been elsewhere. And this is for uh, deaths over 100,000 and above. And you can see that currently we have deaths from this pandemic of approaching 600,000. Um, this was done last week, and at the time it was uh, just under 550,000, but it's climbing rapidly because the pandemic globally is not over. The first wave uh, seems to be accelerating, in fact. What I want to do, uh, though, is to look at the way that these effects from pandemics flow through an economy in an economic sense. At a, Top left, as you look at the screen, I make the point, the obvious point, that this is a government-induced slowdown. This is not a slowdown caused by an economic shock, i.e. overvalued asset prices in the um, uh, commercial property sector or in the banking sector, which led to an economic collapse, or overexpansion in the wider economy, which was ended by high levels of inflation, which caused the central bank to raise interest rates to reduce that inflation and that created an economic shock or some other economic misallocation issue. This is a response to a health crisis and a government induced shutdown. So temporary reduction in production has all sorts of effects. Mandated firm closures clearly reduce supply. They uh, extend supply chain disruption. The uh, reduction uh, of the demand which flows from firms being shut down and people being laid off will have other effects on households, reduce consumption. It will particularly hit credit constrained households. It will lead to a rising precautionary savings which amplifies the downturn. And so the amplification are uh, around factors like uncertainty, confidence, credit conditions I've already mentioned, financial conditions more generally. And that retrenchment by corporates isn't just about a reduction in their output levels and in their employment levels. It's also in lower investment. Worker layoffs we've already mentioned, and that may occur particularly after the government schemes for furloughing workers have ended. Capital scrapping is clearly taking place. And there will be bankruptcies. And also, of course, fewer firms will be started in this period. And that means that the efficiency uh, of the supply side will be impacted. <clears throat> and there was clearly a global effect to this, which will mean that to some extent, uh, there will be an increase in global slack. A gap between potential production and actual production will widen to reduce cost pressures. And all of all sorts of effects, therefore, negatively on inflation. 
So the short term one would expect inflation to be pretty low, although supply disruptions imply maybe that um, inflation globally could rise if there are issues with getting particular goods to market once demand picks up. Of course, all of this is affected by the policy action of the central bank to ease the severity of the downturn uh, and limit its impact on financial markets has all sorts of wealth distributional effects and the increase in government debt in itself will have effects on the curve, uh, on investment decisions, on views on the sustainability of the increase in government debt, so whether it will constrain future government policy given the increase in debt which has taken place in the short term and how uh, that plays with some of the longer term implications, for example, in the UK of an aging population and the requirement to spend more, for example, on, 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 on the elderly and care homes and so forth. So um, there's lots of economic effects which are flowing through as we speak and will take years to be fully reflected and understood. One of the overarching views about this, of course, is that forecasts of clearly shown a sharp reduction in demand and some pickup over future years. The point to note is that very often the focus seems to be on growth, but actually it's on where the level of output is compared with the previous trend. And we don't want to spend, in my view, any time arguing about whether or not this is a V-shape, a U-shape or W-shape. What we do know for sure is that the level of output will take some time to get back to the previous trend it was on. And therefore there is lost output. Output is lower in future years than it would be otherwise and for some considerable period of time. And that's the point really we ought to be focused on. There's a loss of living standards in the short term. And on the right hand side of this graphic, I just illustrate the latest forecasts from the IMF because it's a good summary of a whole host of independent and public forecasts from a bunch of institutions which pretty much average round to an expectation that world output could be down by five to six percent this year. It could be some bounce back next year. The, um, but because it's bouncing back from a lower level, it implies that the uh, uh, level of growth will not be back to where it was previously, of course. And the range of outcomes for countries does differ according to the economic performance and the policy performance and the ability to reduce the effects of the virus and the adaptability of the economy. So it's notable, for instance, that although the average global drop is around 5%, the forecast for the UK is that the drop will be about 10%. So maybe that tells us something about the UK economy and the biases that are in it. It's more services based, for example, there's more hospitality and travel and leisure in, in it. And therefore it may be more severely impact purely because of that, not because it's managed any less well than some of the others, although for some that may well be what their conclusion is. There are big effects on emerging economies and it's noteworthy that unlike the great financial crisis of 11 years ago, when uh, as a whole emerging and developing economies did not see an overall contraction in output, they are this time. And that's why the severity of the global downturn uh, is as much as it is. The effect on the UK and where its profile is. And I'll just show this graphic because there's so much talk of it being the worst economic downturn in 300 and 200 years and, and so forth. But actually the comparison is more with the uh, post-Spanish flu effect and the Great Depression of the 1920s. And <clears throat> we should remember a, a bunch of things around this, which is that of course the, the world is immeasurably richer now than it is then and so better able to cope with this. So poverty levels then are far worse than poverty levels now with living standards being far lower. Education levels, literacy, uh, access to water, access, access to a bunch of goods and services. Uh, was very much for an elite and um, this time of course that one is starting off with much higher living standards and so the, the net effect on people is far lower and uh, there's some false comparisons it seems to me be made about the, the, the hit to the economy and the hit to living standards as a result of this crisis. Nevertheless, um, if you add up the cumulative drop in GDP that occurred in the 1920s either because of the flu, the effects of the first, first world war, then the Great Depression and the policy mistakes were made, well, you know, we're saying a 10% drop, 10 to 14% drop potentially this time. Well, then it was over a third. So um, 
there really isn't a comparison even with a uh, hundred years ago, it seems to me. The shortfall though, will have an effect on the UK over the years ahead. And if we look at it in terms of levels of GDP, even with a sharp bounce back in growth next year, growth will be below the level it would have been otherwise. And if I overlaid this with a graphic of the post financial crisis economy, you'd see that the trend of UK growth prior to the financial crisis then was higher than the trend which proceed, which followed it. And this time it will be the same thing. So we would have experienced two shocks, which would have on average lowered the level of growth for the future years quite substantially. This time, uh, the effect looks like it will lower growth to the order of about 400, well, certainly over 400 billion is what we estimate we'd have as lost output, um, hits to living standard accumulated over a five year period. So these are considerably numbers and they will reduce the ability to be able to finance all sorts of things in the economy which would otherwise have been able to do. In other words, we will be poorer, but the world was a lot poorer in 1918. And these are figures um, which have been accumulated uh, over a number of years from lots of different sources, pretty much widely accepted. Of course, um, it's pretty meager living standards, um, you know, from the 90 and so on and so forth, doesn't sound like a lot of money to live on, but at least you can live on that sort of money. The point is what it illustrates, the trend that it's showing, and the trend and the point it's illustrating are that the number of people living in poverty today are far lower than was the case 100 years ago. And that this progress seems to have accelerated after 1940. So there are a number of things we should take from this. One, of course, for me is that globalization works, that the post Second World War institutions generated the access to a greater pool of global supply chains, that a whole bunch of economic uh, changes took place around refrigeration and so on, which helped to incredibly lower the cost of um, shifting goods around the world, greater access to markets, greater economies of scale, greater productivity levels took place. But let me focus on the aftermath of this current crisis, which is that interest rates have been slashed. They're more negative in countries where they were negative before, so like Japan and Switzerland, the Eurozone. UK, we've cut interest rates to 0.1%, the US zero to, to 0.25%. The governor of the Bank of England is currently talking to banks and others in financial markets about the possibility of negative interest rates, which means that, of course, the ground is being prepared for it if it's necessary. So there's been a huge loosening of monetary policy taking place. And that this has put a lot of liquidity into financial markets, which is what is bowing uh, and creating conditions for quite um, significant increases in asset prices off their lows, which is a wealth effect. And it's um, maybe widening wealth inequalities for those who are concerned about those things. The which is where the elderly can gain, of course, because they have more access to, to this wealth. And therefore, relative to the young, they're seeing increases in their wealth, even during this crisis. One of the effects, though, of this action is that there'll be even more negative yield in bonds, and returns to investors will therefore decline. Uh, market expectations of where the yields are going to be for different categories of bonds shows quite conclusively that the persistence of negative yield in bonds will continue, that yields will drop from averaging 2 to 3% to mainly averaging between 0 to 1%, um, with a proportion above that growing to quite significant levels, yielding 1 to 2% uh, being quite large. So uh, lower returns is one of the things that will come out of this, this crisis. Balance sheets of central banks have increased enormously, i.e. their share 
of the economy in terms of the financial aspect of it, their share of bond markets in particular, rising towards 30 to 50 percent. Um, the UK's outstanding stock of bonds bought by the central bank will end up at around 645 billion. For the Fed, it will be around about anything between 7 to 10 trillion, which is around 47 percent or so of their economy. Similar figures for the EU. And to some extent, we've got to ask ourselves the question, surely this will lead to another market crash at some point because of the overvaluation of these assets. And inflation really stay low once this is over. And effectively, the put option of the uh, investors downside being protected by central banks stepping in when there's precipitous falls in the value of the assets that they've bought surely is leading to moral hazard issues. And effectively, the balance sheet of those who don't invest in these things to be used to protect those who do invest in these risky instruments. And so somehow that sits uneasily uh, with some. And that had political ramifications after the global financial crisis, for example, where there was a sense that bankers and others were rescued, but normal workers weren't. So monetary expansion could lead to inflation, for sure, in my opinion. If policy isn't corrected, after the pandemic is past its worst and the economy looks as if it's recovering. And we know that that's a risk because money supply growth is soaring to unprecedented levels in lots of places. And if there is a link between the quantity of money and its acceleration and with price inflation, then we'd expect to see price inflation unless policy responds to it. And on the left-hand side of this, I'll just make a few points about the fact that um, if price inflation is not responded to with policy timing, then there's a risk that inflation expectations get embedded into the system and therefore there will be a rise in inflation as a consequence. So um, it will be difficult in my view to actually tighten policy too much because after the misery created by this pandemic, people want a period where growth does look as if it's, it's, it's livelier uh, and that prospects are looking rather better. There's some good news though, which is that the rate of te technological change will not slow. There is some um, trends in place here which are not affected by the cyclical effects in my view of this pandemic. The um, focus has got still to be on education, training, skill sets, and clearly sound money. And in my view uh, around free markets is that we should wherever possible end rent seeking. And I think there's been lots of rent seeking going on. Uh, we can see it from the way the skew of the distribution of the gains from growth have gone to those that are better off. They seem to have better connections and seem to be getting the better benefits of some of the growth uh, in major economies over the last few decades. And efforts to break up monopolies and oligopolies should clearly be intensified in my view. This is one of the risks that, that there is out there. Just to end on a few points about financial markets. So the low point of the financial market experience from uh, the COVID crisis was that, for instance, uh, in the US, um, S&P was down around 25% um, uh, on December um, 31st. Uh, in one week to the 18th of March, it was down 12.5%. Um, for the UK, it was down over a, almost a third. Clearly, um, that was pricing in weaker growth, rising defaults, and so forth, as they should. Um, but where are we now? Well, where we are now, now being July the 1st, is that the S&P is only off 3.6%, rose 2% in one week. Uh, in the UK, it's, it's now off half of the level it was before, just over half the level it was before. Um, and so there appears to be less worry about uh, the economic consequences of this. And is that a result of a view that the economy is going to recover more strongly? Or is it just the weight of money that's been poured in? Clearly, it's the weight of money because um, we're not even through the first wave yet. Um, and there will, there will be defaults, there will be greater levels of unemployment. Uh, and yet, it's not priced in. Um, <clears throat> I want to make a couple of longer term points about the effects of pandemics on economies. They do tend to lower real interest rates. And they they did that for Europe as a whole, uh, and they did that for the UK. 
And this effect of low and real interest rates could last up to 40 years. In other words, we could see a continuation of a secular long-term decline in real interest rates. So the natural rate of interest appears to be falling. Uh, and this crisis will make that trend even more attenuated uh, over the coming decade. And there's all sorts of reasons for this which do stand up, it seems to me. Uh, and some of this debate about whether it's unusual that returns have fallen as they have been over the last decade is actually misleading because if you go back a few hundred years, it's clear that there has been a secular long-term trend decline in long-term interest rates. Um, let me just make a couple of points about debt. Um, government debt has exploded. Um, fiscal balances are severely in um, to negative territory as well here. Uh, 130 billion, maybe a cumulative 300 billion or so over the coming uh, five years is going to wreck havoc uh, on the sustainability of the public finances. It does imply higher taxation. It does imply a tightening of the belts. It does imply more focus on where value added is from um, public sector spending. The good news, as I mentioned earlier, is that the pace of technological adoption is still accelerating. Wait till we get quantum computers. Wait till we get driverless cars. Wait till we get uh, the sorts of uh, interactions with um, uh, biotech, which is entirely possible over the coming decade. Growth could speed up simply because productivity is so large. Sharing that out amongst different sectors of the economy is a different thing. The gains from that uh, and how it's done is important. But um, in this long period that I looked at earlier where real interest rates fell and, and where poverty declined, one of the features of it is the fact that technology continued to change the world. So in conclusion, there's a societal impact. What about Brexit? Political fallout? How competent were leaders? The environmental impact? Innovation? The power of information? Growing yourself out of debt? All suffer lower living standards? Seems to be the only thing possible in a world where uh, constraints are, are greater. And it's not all negative. There will be opportunity because change brings disruption. Disruption changes the risk profile and there are winners and losers. Innovation to fix the old problems and move forward with optimism to solve uh, some of the new ones will mean that formation of companies will, will continue, in my view. So it isn't all bleak. Um, pandemics traditionally do lead to social change, which is good, because they tend to uh, accentuate uh, the um, issues and schisms that there are in society and lead to greater agita agitation. Uh, to change some of those things. And that always seems to me ends up for the better because history shows that it does. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me. I'll pass you over to Saeed and we've got plenty of time for questions. Well, Trevor, thank you very much. Um, I've heard you give a, a, a talk before and this is one of the reasons that I, uh, we invited you at the IEA. I wonder whether you could just unshare the screen uh, if possible and then we'll uh, turn, to the, turn to the Q&A. Can I encourage you all to um, please submit questions. Don't be shy. Um, and if you are shy, and I can't convince you not to be, uh, submit the question uh, anonymously, if you prefer. We already see one person has uh, um, submitted two questions. I will ask both his questions if uh, others don't respond uh, or don't come forward. But let, 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 look, um, let's start off with a, a, a broad question. Uh, Trevor, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that we, uh, we got it to clash uh, or you know, we, we organise this to clash with Rishi Sunak's statement. I, 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 apo I apologise for that. But if Rishi Sunak had come to you today and said, Trevor, I also apologise for the fact that I can't join you at the IA webinar. I have to go and give a, a statement to the country. But what would you advise, Trevor? What should I be announcing? What would you have advised him without giving away what he has announced? Yet? <laughs> well, I mean, clearly he's got to, it seems to me, announce an extension of the furlough schemes and those that prevent unemployment from rising sharply. Um, it should do more for um, short, and this is all short-term help, by the way, to get over the hump created by the uh, worst effects of the pandemic. Um, creating conditions for firms to survive for longer, um, whilst things get back to some semblance of normality, and for people to not lose their jobs, um, unless the firm behind them is not in a position to be able to continue. So I think schemes to extend furloughing, schemes to help the arts and culture seems to be necessary to me. I don't agree with um, 
boost in the housing market because I don't think that's the problem. I would argue that um, we should build more social housing. We should use the private sector to do so, unleash a building boom which is sustainable because it feeds a need for those that are lower down the income uh, spectrum. There's been a, uh, too much focus on home ownership and not enough focus on those that have felt the social effects of not being able to get on the housing ladder. I think that's a huge mistake. It's harmed our productivity and it's actually led to some of the regional, regional gaps as well. And on the uh, fiscal side, I think that they should actually, it seems to me, try to um, um, uh, define the amount of expenditure being done on the pandemic and separate it out from normal day-to-day -day spending. So in other words, you've got to ensure that you meet some sort of fiscal rule, which means that you bring the deficit down in the long term. And to do that, I think that they should put the bucket of spending related to COVID into a separate category and say, we will pay that down over the longer term. In the shorter term, we're going to, in the, in the medium term, we're going to focus on non-COVID spending. And that, we will ensure, does over time fall back towards levels um, which are sustainable. So I think those are the sorts of things which I would start to touch on in this budget. Right, well, we've got some questions coming in. But before I turn to those, I would encourage others to uh, please submit questions as well. Also, I've put a link in the chat function to Trevor's uh, website if you want to find out more about him and his work. Trevor, if there's anything else that you want to publicize that you've done, please feel free to put it in the, the chat function. Um, one of the things you talked about there was private investment in housing um, and more private investment in, in social housing. One of the interesting things that I find is when I talk to a large, lot of the fund managers, asset managers, they say to me, look, we want to invest more in infrastructure in the UK. We'd happily do so. The problem is the Treasury doesn't understand that we have to make a return as well. And so it's, not, it's actually not very attractive for us. Now, we know about the problems with private finance initiative and PPP. We're prepared to take all the risk. But the Treasury has to allow us to make a return. And we'd happily invest in you know, railways, roads, etc. But because the government doesn't do that, what we tend to do is invest in stuff that they don't interfere in. So for example, you've seen a boost in private uh, student housing around the country. A lot of that is fueled by these asset managers investing in that, whereas they could well be investing in infrastructure. How do we encourage that? What, do, what does the treasury have to do? Or do you think it's just a cultural problem with the treasury? You know, not invented here, we don't want your idea, um, or we, we're very suspicious of you guys making money for public infrastructure. I think it's one of those things. Um, I think it's around the, uh, the way that we tax land, fundamentally. Um, I think it's um, the planning rules, um, which inhibit building in places people actually want to live um, at the expense of those who want to move into those areas uh, and to the benefit of those who have captured local authorities and said, well, I don't want you to build anything more in my backyard now that I have a place with you know, a 10 mile view of the Yorkshire Downs. I don't want anything in interrupting that view um, to, the, uh, to the cost of anyone else who wants to live in the Yorkshire Downs alongside them. So um, I think that um, sweeping away the planning regs is key to this, um, as well as the way that we deal with, um, with, with uh, stamp duty. We should abolish stamp duty and, and uh, we should be taxing um, uh, the land in a different way. Okay, um, well, I'm pleased to see that uh, the Rishi Sunak has announced a temporary cut in stamp duty. I wish it was permanent so people could downsize if they wanted to, yeah, free up more exactly. properties as well as allow people yeah. to move to uh, family homes. One last question from me before I open it up, which was, you one of your slides talks about pandemics do not stop innovation. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Steve Davies, who wrote the... Um, they create innovation, actually, because you're yeah. solving problems created by the... Exactly. Pandemic. Disruption yeah. does lead to innovation. Yes, actually. yes, yes. Exactly. Um, but Steve Davis, who wrote one of our uh, IEA COVID-19 briefing papers about the history and economics of pandemics, also says that sometimes pandemics tend to accelerate pre-existing trends. Oh, they do. Uh, they do. Yeah. They Are there do. any examples that you think of existing trends that we saw before the pandemic that you think will be accelerated? Um, I mean, if I've got well, you on the spot, go on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great question, Sai, but, but we're seeing it already, aren't we? So tech companies, yeah. those with a distribution network um, through the internet, so Amazon uh, uh, and all of those companies who have already started to build that infrastructure have benefited enormously from this. Um, and I think that um, it was, it, it, so it's driving those sorts of things. Biotech, for example, will be driven by this. The, 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 the move into um, much more uh, focus on 
how you deal with uh, health emergencies, i.e. health scares which are driven by increasing uh, human interaction with the animal kingdom and the new pathogens which have been generated and the way that we bring uh, medicines to market and so forth. That has been changed by this. So it seems to me that there's some clear effects already uh, from what's going on. It's, it's leading to the end of the older industries and birth of the newer ones much more quickly than otherwise. Great. Well, on that note, um, what I'll do is I will turn, I'll post in the chat function a link or ask one of my colleagues to post a link to Steve Davis's paper on the uh, history and, 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 and economics of pandemics. Um, I'll turn to the questions. Please uh, keep them coming. Um, now, let's have, let's have a look at some, some, some of these questions. Let's start with the first one. And can I also encourage others to vote on them? And that helps me choose which ones so people aren't disappointed. So the first one is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what do you make of the claims that uh, BAME groups, uh, black and minority ethnic groups in the UK, have disproportionately suffered more during the COVID-19 crisis? And how can we prevent this from happening in future pandemics? Um, just, you know, I, I have to well, well I, don't know if it's, I don't know if it's claims that they have. I mean, the evidence says they have, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. The death rates just tell their own story, surely. Um, and it's because they're clustered in, 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 in occupations which rub up against the public. Um, and where there wasn't the sort of PPE coverage. Um, so I think the, the answer is why that is, is quite clear. Um, I, what can you do to prevent it? Well, I think um, uh, there's an issue, of, obviously, in this crisis that we're all in it together, essential workers. Who are essential workers? Drivers, cleaners, hospital workers, um, doctors on the front line. So lots of, lots of the front line that doctors are actually, and I hate the phrase BAME, by the way. I mean, I, I always think these things become pejorative, and I think that, uh, as far as I know, there's only one human race. Uh, so I always worry with, with these phrases, which kind of tend to say that people are different for uh, reasons other than uh, melanin in their skin and so forth. But um, setting that aside for the moment, I think that um, the poor and those that are in professions which are at high risk of catching the infection are the reasons why we've seen what we've seen. And there is, is, there's no other evidence other than that. Uh, and so... How do we pay essential workers, those who keep the wheels turning? You know, why do we value, um, I don't know, city financier more than we value a doctor or more than we value someone who um, makes sure that the, uh, the roads are open, that the trains are running on time, that buses are there? Look, these things cannot happen without these people. And I think one of the lessons from the pandemic is clearly that um, society maybe needs to think about the way we function. And I think economically, it is difficult to see how you pay people more in some professions. I absolutely agree with that. Um, but that's a societal decision that we should make. Um, and they are essential, um, but we're definitely not all in it together. There's a host of ways you can prove that that's the case from the data. And as you say, demographically, a lot of people from ethnic minority communities tend to live in urban areas, tend to be more clustered. The, the sort of work they do, you know, when I think about my, my parents, Absolutely. my father came to England from Guyana. He, you know, he worked on the railways and the buses, but that, because the British government was asking people to come and fill those jobs in the 40s, 50s and 60s, uh, for, for example. But the next generation, you know, like people like you and me, you know, I'm sure our parents said to us they didn't want us to do the jobs they were doing and they wanted us to study and... Um, and education helped us overcome some of those barriers uh, for those jobs that have, you know, made qualifications. Yes, and, and so you're so right, because in one of the slides I point out that it's education, education, education. Um, and that's how society moves on, that people move up uh, the value-added chain of, uh, of jobs, the productivity levels are higher. Um, but you have to have, I, as a liberal, um, uh, I think, I, I don't, want to see quality of outcomes, but I want to see quality of opportunity. And some of the glaring inequalities is clearly what these protests are about, which is one of the effects of these crises, by the way, because it makes it more stark what's going on. And people think, well, I've got nothing to lose, so I'm going to demand change right now. And I think that that's the social angst that we're currently seeing, and there's no stopping it. Uh, it's a different generation. Uh, it's the sons and daughters of those people that were uh, experienced other things in earlier generations, Saeed, and they and, they and the people they, they now live with in those populations find that it's unacceptable. So I think that the momentum is quite huge for 
significant social change to take place. But that should not be surprising because this is what happens at, at hinge points and moments of crises like this. Yeah. As you say, I mean, I know we get, we're getting into this, but many immigrants, you know, whether you talk to taxi drivers in New York or you talk to our sort of parents, they want their children to be educated because they feel that's the way to, to tackle these problems. Yeah. Well, I think that what was the phrase that the rapper once used? Fight with words and not the fist against social injustice. <laughs> anyway, um, on that very bad rapping, let's move on. Uh, Mark Benier asks, on the wealth inequality created through property, how do you view the increase of stamp duty threshold from 125,000 to 500,000? which Rishi Sunak has just announced. Um, is this wise? Well, again, it benefits the better off. Those who probably have got on the housing ladder anyway. I, as I said, I think the focus should be on social housing and showing that we are all in it together. Your nurses, uh, your care workers, uh, your essential workers who can't live in the cities where they need to be because they've stopped building. Since the local housing, the local authority housing stock was sold off after the Thatcher Revolution, we've never built it back. And so the, the growing housing inequality will become a crisis for us. And I, I, unfortunately, I think that it will have to become a crisis before there'll be political action. Um, because the winners are just taking all of the gains from the growth that's come on and they're forgetting about the ladder, which needs to um, you know, be kept uh, so that others can climb up it rather than pulling it up. So I, I think it's, it's the wrong way to use the money. I think we should abolish stamp duty, by the way, don't get me wrong, as I mentioned earlier. But I also think that we should unleash a social house building program for those who cannot afford these house prices. Um, and to ensure that we have the uh, adaptability in our inner cities and in um, more generally where people need to be where the work is. Um, so we need social housing. Right, okay, um, next question. Uh, but he said nothing uh, about that, of course. Right? Sorry? Uh, he said nothing about that to my knowledge in the budget. So I don't know I, yet. I, I, I was listening don't know to yet, but it's a, it's a glaring omission if, the, if it's not mentioned. Um, next one from an anonymous attendee. So please keep the questions coming. Uh, is there another programme of austerity inevitable due to the growth in debt? No. I think that it's not inevitable that there'll be austerity the way that we had austerity, because that austerity that we had, in my view, hit the poorest and, and those least... Uh, least able to uh, to to uh, uh, benefit from the opportunities that the economy had, and that was a huge mistake. I, as I said, it's cost the social budget. We've seen the social consequences all around us, where you know two thirds of all of the um, youth centres were shut down, um, uh, schools uh, were badly affected, uh, hospitals were badly affected, less adaptable, less able to meet the challenges of COVID, for instance. So I think those those with hindsight were big mistakes. And we're reaping the social well-being from that. So I don't think there'll be that sort of austerity. I think we need, the government needs to pick areas that it can spend on and let businesses and people step into areas that it doesn't need to be in. And I think that that, that is part of the liberal argument. It's interesting you say that because uh, our previous IE publication, which I will put up a link to in a minute, talked about the uh, so-called austerity and found it wasn't as savage as people were made out. What happened is that it was different parts of government spending that were cut. So, for example, you saw increases in health spending, and most people probably would agree with that, but you also saw a massive increase in foreign aid spending, for, for example, from the same budget. But some of the other programmes, you did see cuts, and therefore, overall, uh, government spending didn't fall by as much as some claim. It was individual departments, and I suppose it, that, that plays to your point about whether, you know, wh whatever you think it is austerity or not, whether the government's priorities were right. And, and the long-term consequences. Yeah, but I also make a point about that side. I don't think it's even that they were cut. I think that if the growth rate slowed down significantly enough, then that in itself was harm. Yeah. In some of these key areas that you mentioned. So just to keep pace with um, the needs of some sectors and with the shifts in population in, in different parts of the country. And remember, we still had positive population growth. We had growth of uh, uh, the young in various cohorts and in various parts of the country. And so it wasn't so much that those programs weren't cut in absolute terms, it's that they didn't grow in the way that maybe they would otherwise have done uh, because the needs were rising faster than the uh, amount of funding available. And that's, that's the challenge, care home challenge, health challenge. Uh, although you're right, spending on health rose. If you look historically at spending on health, during the decade, it fell to about 1.1%. Well, the longer on average is around 2.8%. So that's a savage cut in terms of spending growth. 
Now, whether you should, that's how you should think about, uh, you look after the NHS and, 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 and have um, uh, healthcare free at the point of use, that's a different argument. I think there's different ways of doing it. If you look at the experience of other parts of the world, and you, you can see that you know, the NHS is very good at many things, but it ain't efficient at keeping you alive. Yeah, we, we, found, we found in studies that the outcomes, you know, you're more likely to die on, with particular diseases in this country. And sometimes even health, care, health managers say to us they're constrained by the fact that they rely purely on taxpayer funding. You, know, yeah. you, you can't charge even £10 for people to go to the doctors, for example, and those who can afford it. Now, next question, um, and please keep the questions coming. Um, I'm, just, I'm going to interpret it because I'm not sure what they say, mean. They say, do you think there's anything the UK government can learn from modern monetary theory. I think they mean new monetary right. policy. New monetary. Yeah, budget through financing indefinitely. The answer is no. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you say you that. can't run budget deficits forever. I've had this point before where people said, yeah, but surely if debt increases, that means that there's a, you know, you think of a balance sheet. If, if you've got debt, there's an asset on the other side. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. Can you service it? You know, do those who fund you believe that you'll be able to pay them back? Um, I think one of the things, though, from the charts I showed earlier, and the conclusion you should draw from it is that uh, funding deficits, when real interest rates are lower, means that you'll be able to run with bigger deficits maybe than we have in the peacetime period, a post-war period. Uh, so I believe that the financing of the deficits may well be a bit easier over the next few years, partly because we've got higher savings and therefore lower interest rates and lower real interest rates in particular. So the debt burden may not be as biting as it otherwise would be. But yes, debt, the too fast an increase in government debt clearly is a long-term issue and it's not something we should want because we want the flexibility to be able to respond to crises such as we did to this one. Great. So um, on, on that point, um, is it, we, we recently had a webinar with uh, Tim Congdon and with Juan Castaneda um, mm. on the, the uh, monetary implications of the COVID crisis and they I talked about